Today we're going to be talking about thermodynamics. We're done with equilibrium, we're done with kinetics, right? So we are gonna still deal with K. So unfortunately, K is never going to fully go away until you exit this room. And even then, if you go on to take organic, you'll be using the equilibrium constant in there as well. But we're gonna look at K a little bit differently. Um, and actually, K isn't gonna be in the picture at all today. So if you are kind of K'd out, you can take a little bit of a break. Um, there's a file for all of you online students on the homepage, Intro to Thermodynamics Vocab List. You can download this from the web page. We're gonna be covering a lot of vocabulary today. And so to save your little hands, I've given you a little bit of a note-taking guide. Of course, you're gonna write every word yourself. You're welcome to do that. Um, all these words are also in the notes. Just thought I'd give you a little post-spring break present. Welcome back to school kind of thing. <laughs> We're going to be talking about a lot of different vocabulary today, some of which is review and some of which is going to be brand new. So let's get to it. We've got a lot of vocab. <clears throat> energy is a word we used last semester. <coughs> right? Energy is the ability to do work or transfer heat. We used that word last semester in Chem 1. We also talked about the law of conservation of energy last semester in Chem 1 <clears throat> when we said that energy is never created or destroyed, just changes forms. Right, so thermal energy can be converted into um, potential energy, right? So we're just changing forms. We're never creating or destroying energy. We also talked about the system last semester when we talked about enthalpy. We said that the system is composed of the molecules that we're interested in, and then what's everything else called? Think back to last semester. Also begins with S. Surroundings, right? Surroundings would be everything around the system. So if I'm studying these molecules in the beaker, the molecules themselves that I'm interested in are my system, and then the beaker and everything around it would be my surroundings. We talked about work last semester as well. Not in great detail. But we did use the word, right, work, which we represent with lowercase w, is energy that we use to move an object some distance, right? So that's energy that we use to move an object some distance. And then we definitely talked about this a lot last semester. Heat, which is another word for enthalpy, right? Heat and enthalpy are synonyms. We represent heat and enthalpy both by delta H, uppercase H, and lowercase q. Right, not uppercase Q, what's uppercase Q? That's the reaction quotient, right? The uppercase Q is when we plug in initial concentrations to an equilibrium expression. That's not the same thing as lowercase Q, right? Lowercase Q is another word for heat, which is another word for enthalpy, right? So we used both delta H and Q last semester when we were talking about enthalpy, which is just energy used to increase temperature of an object. Remember last semester we talked about the definition of temperature. What's the definition of temperature? It's a measure of the kinetic energy of the particles, right? Remember we talked about how um, I'm a big nerd, my husband's a big nerd, we're raising little junior nerds, and how we explain to our four-year-olds something's hot because it's got high kinetic energy, right? Temperature is just a measure of kinetic energy. All right, so work can be done on the system, right? And work can be done by the system. Remember, the molecules of interest are our system, and the system can do work, and the system can have work done to it, right? So if the um, gas, for instance, this is a gas, expands, right, versus if it has been contracted, in one scenario, work is being done by the system, in one scenario, work has been done to the system. And so internal energy is a word we haven't used yet, we represent that as uppercase E, and it's the sum of all the available energy to our system. It's the sum of all the available energies to our system. So it's, in other words, it's heat and work put together, right? So how much kinetic energy do I have? Right, because heat, essentially, kinetic energy, it's a measure of how much energy I've got available to increase temperature, right? And work, so how much energy do I have to 
apply forces, right? So internal energy is the sum of all the energy that I've got available to me. So delta E is equal to Q plus W, right? And so when we are exchanging energy between the system and the surroundings, it can be done as heat or it can be done as work, right? Heat can go into the system, heat can come out of the system. Work can be done on the system, work can be done by the system. Right, so that exchange can come out as either Q or W. And so this is a figure from an old version of a textbook. We don't, uh, I think this is maybe like the fifth or sixth edition. It's an old edition of a book. Right, so if Q is positive, that means the system is gaining heat. And if Q is negative, the system is losing heat. Right? If work, W is positive, work's done on the system versus work being done by the system. And then if delta E is positive, the, in, the energy is being gained as a whole by the system versus loss of energy by the system. So let's do this one together. Calculate the change in internal energy of the system for an endothermic process in which 15.6 uh, 15 kilojoules of heat flows and where 1.4 kilojoules of work is done on the system. So how would I calculate E here? Well, I need to break down what the problem's telling me here. Q needs to be positive, and which value goes with Q, the 15.6 or the 1.4? Which one goes with Q? 15.6, right? And I said that it's an endothermic process, so that's why Q is positive, right? Endothermic Q is positive. So that's why I have a positive 15.6 here. And work is done on the system, right? That's work that's being done on the system. <clears throat> that's why W is also positive, right? So positive, positive, making sure my units are the same because I can't add kilojoules and joules, right? Making sure my units are the same. Total gain of 17 kilojoules. Remember, we've got to look at the problem. We've got to remember our definitions from last semester about exothermic and endothermic, right? Heat going in, endothermic, heat going out, exothermic, right? And then is, heat, is work being done on the system or is work being done by the system, right? If it's being done on the system, that's like free money, right? Work being done by the system, you got to put forth that effort. So does everyone understand why the signs were the way they were? why neither of these numbers are negative. So everybody see why this is a positive 15.6 and a positive 1.4, and why neither of them are negative. Is everybody good? All right, I'm gonna pause the recording and let you try this one. Calculate the change in the internal energy of the system for a process in which the system absorbs 140 joules of heat from the surroundings and does 85 joules of work on the surroundings. So take a minute, think about this, and come up with an answer. All right, let's look at what we got. So we need to look at the interpretation of the sign of Q and W from the problem. The system absorbs 140 joules, so does that mean that that value is positive or negative? That would be positive, right. And does 85 joules, what would that mean its sign is? Negative, right. So Q is positive, W is negative, right. If you have to go move your books from this table to that table, you've applied some sort of effort, right. Work is done by you, right. You have moved the books some distance. So work would be negative. But heat is being absorbed, that's why Q is positive. Both units are joules, so we don't need to worry about converting units. Final answer is 55, net gain. Do we agree? We see how to do this? So far the math's not too nasty, right? Uh, no. Today it will, but Wednesday not so much. All right, we talked about state functions last semester. Does anyone remember what a state function is? 
can look at your handout, right? It's a process where we don't care how you get from the start to the finish, right? My boss doesn't care how I get here in the morning as long as I get here to teach you people, right? I could fly, I could walk, I could row in a boat, I could take a bus, I could take a taxi, I could ride a bike, right? Nobody cares how I get here as long as I'm here. So that's what a state function is. We don't really care, we're not interested in how we got from our initial conditions to our final conditions. Now kinetics does, right? Kinetics, that's the mechanism. That's the exact steps of the reactions. Kinetics does care about how do you get from point A to point B. But thermodynamics doesn't, right? So this is the example I gave last semester. You could take water at zero degrees and heat it to 50, or you could take water at 100 and cool it to 50. Would you be able to tell a difference at the end between the water that was heated versus the water that was cooled? Could you tell a difference at the end? Oh, well, this water is definitely the water that was cooled. This is water definitely that was heated. No. All right, your final answer, you won't be able to see the difference. Okay, now remember, this is not the same thing as kinetics. Kinetics reaction mechanisms, very, very specific on how we get from point A to point B. All right, catalysts change the reaction mechanism. So we are very interested in mechanisms when we're talking about kinetics. We are very, very interested in whether or not you ride your bike versus walk, versus take a taxi, right? If we're studying kinetics. If we're studying thermodynamics, we're not looking at the kinetics. We're only looking at final compared to initial. Okay, so now that it's March Madness time, this is appropriate, right? There are a lot of ways your team could win. Most people, I put most people, because there are some people who are like, you gotta win by X amount if you're, you know, doing things that involve money. But most people, I don't care how they win, they just care that they win, right? Um, I'm fully prepared to have my heart just ripped out of my chest, so we're ready, ready to go. But, um, you know, most people, they don't care how you get there. If you look good doing it, you just want to see to do it. All right, let's just review, even though we've already talked about this today, right? Endothermic has positive delta H, right? He enters the system. Exothermic has heat exiting the system, right? Delta H is negative. So let's just do these together. I've got three reactions going on here. I've given you their delta H's. My units got chopped off down here. So you just tell me if it's exothermic or endothermic. What's the first one? That'd be endothermic. What about the second one? Exothermic and endothermic, good. Right, so the study of heat and its conversions is called thermodynamics. You'll take entire courses on thermodynamics if you have been convinced by me to become a chem major. And even if you're not a chem major, depending on what you are majoring in, you may still have to take thermo. Um, I personally enjoyed taking thermodynamics, that was just me. But um, you can take entire courses on this at the undergrad and the graduate level. Three laws of thermodynamics we'll be talking about today. First law says that the energy of the universe, and that's uppercase universe, right? The entire existence, all matter. The energy of the universe is constant. So basically the first law of the thermodynamics states the same thing as what? We've already seen this today. Law of conservation of mass, right? First law of thermodynamics is the same thing as the law of conservation of energy. We've, we've already seen the first law of thermodynamics today, we just didn't officially give it that title. Okay, so the first law of thermodynamics is something you've already seen. We're not creating energy, we're not destroying energy, we're transferring it from one form to another, from one place to another. Right? We're conserving energy in all chemical, physical, nuclear changes. Okay, now this is one of my personal pet peeves. I see it on TV a lot. Um, and so we need to really make sure we understand what we're talking about when we use the word spontaneous, especially now that we're back from spring break. Oh, I spontaneously dyed my hair green this spring break. Well, see, no, you didn't. Okay, you know, a lot of people misuse the word spontaneous as a synonym for random, and that's not the same thing, okay? So if you go a little spontaneously, if you go get a piercing spontaneously, well, that's not really spontaneous process. Okay, we chemists use this word in a very specific way. So random means unintentional, right? Oh, I randomly ran into 
so-and-so at the grocery store. Right? That was, that's what we mean by random. Or um, here, pick a card out of this deck. Right? You're not intentionally picking uh, the three of clubs. Right? You're just randomly pulling one out of the deck. So random would be like a synonym for unintentional or haphazardly. Right? But when we use it as a synonym for spontaneous, that's not a good decision because a spontaneous process is something that occurs without outside help. Something that occurs spontaneously means that you don't have to help it in order for it to happen. If you get your hair dyed, you had to do something to make your hair go from being blonde to being green, right? So therefore, dyeing your hair is not spontaneous. So if you said, I spontaneously dyed my hair over spring break, well, no, you didn't, right? Because your hair had to have some effort applied to it to turn colors. So don't use spontaneous as a synonym for something else because make sure you're understanding that a spontaneous one process is one where you don't have to help it in order for it to happen. So for instance, when something hot becomes something cold, that happens spontaneously, right? You don't have to apply any outside effort for it to happen. You can take steps to slow that process down, putting it in a thermo, you know, insulated mug or whatever, but it's going to happen eventually, right? If you have a cup of hot coffee and you come back and it's cold coffee, did you do anything for that to happen? No, right? Heat transfer from hot to cold is a spontaneous process. But the other direction, right, if you want heat to go from cold to hot, that's non-spontaneous because you have to put forth effort for that. And a good example of that would be your refrigerator. You can go home tonight and try this out if you want. You can shove your hand underneath there. You can shove your head underneath your fridge. You can feel it's, it's hot underneath your fridge, right? You are using electricity and some other processes to literally make heat flow the opposite direction that it spontaneously wants to go, right? So that's why you've got to plug in your refrigerator for it to work, right? You unplug your fridge, the spontaneous process occurs, hot to cold, um, hot from outside your fridge goes into your cold fridge, Right, but to make the reverse happen, you gotta plug your refrigerator back in. Right, so we can even take it a step simpler than that. If you've got a ball, bowling ball at the top of a hill, it rolls down without any assistance, right? But if you want the bowling ball back up the hill, well, that's non-spontaneous. You'll have to apply some sort of energy for that. So it can be spontaneous one way and non-spontaneous the other way, right? This nail, if you leave it sitting out, on the street, it will rust spontaneously. There's no effort applied there. But if you want that rust to be gone, well, that's non-spontaneous. So you can be spontaneous one way and non-spontaneous the other direction. And also spontaneity is temperature dependent, right? It's gonna be temperature dependent because if the temperature is greater than zero, it would be spontaneous for your ice to melt, right? But if your temperature is less than zero, it would be spontaneous for your water to freeze. So spontaneity is also temperature dependent. So when we deal with thermodynamics in our discussions for the next couple weeks, we're also going to be factoring in temperature, just like we did with equilibrium, right? Because all our equilibrium constants were temperature dependent as well. So if it's spontaneous at one temperature, it may not necessarily be spontaneous at another temperature. Also, we need to talk about what is something that's reversible. Right? We think of the word reverse as just like, you know, putting your car in reverse and go backwards. Okay, great. Well, from a chemist's point of view, reversible processes um, are things that you can do to put everything back in their original states by an exact reversal. So the whole thing can get exactly back to the way it was with just one simple exact reversal, which is a lot more complicated than it sounds. Right? You know, if you hit undo on your computer, that's a little different than what we're talking about in a, in a lab situation. Okay? Putting those molecules exactly back where they were, that's, is that possible? Exactly back where they were? Right? Things start getting a lot more difficult when we're dealing with uh, actual molecules. And then irreversible processes cannot be undone by an exact reversal. And here's something you need to know about an irreversible process and the relationship to spontaneity. Any spontaneous process is going to be irreversible. 
okay? Any spontaneous process would be irreversible from a chemist's point of view. Now remember, you say to yourself, oh, well I heated that up, now I can cool it down, that's reversible. But you've got to think about the chemical definition of reversibility, putting things back to their exact positions, okay? So are you able to get those molecules back to their exact positions? No, right? So a spontaneous process will be irreversible. Let's talk about entropy, which we denote with an uppercase S. Okay, entropy describes the number of arrangements that are available to you under given conditions. And this second statement is kind of a duh statement. We spontaneously proceed towards the state that is the highest probability. It's kind of like, duh. Right? If you've got the highest probability of X happening, then it's most likely that X will happen. Right? We're spontaneously proceeding towards the arrangement. When we say state, we mean arrangement, not physical location. Right? We are proceeding towards the physical arrangement that is the most likely, i.e. most probable, to exist. Right? Thermodynamics um, is very, very heavily influenced by entropy. And it sounds a little nasty, but I'm going to give you some really, really concrete world examples that I think will put it into perspective here. So you can think about entropy as like disorder, right? Low disorder, high order or low order? Is this a highly ordered picture or a low order? Right, if you take a deck of cards and you just throw it up in the air, right, that's, that's high entropy. Right? This is very, very disordered. And there are a lot of different arrangements here right? that would still produce highly disordered. Right? Whereas if you've got this nice, neat stack, is that high entropy or low entropy? Which one would this be? I mean, yes, there is a finite number of ways you can arrange them. You can arrange them by um, color, you can arrange them by number, you can arrange them by you know, ascending versus descending. But the number of states that give you this configuration is much, much higher than the number of states that would give you a nice neat deck, right? Because even if you're a statistician and you calculate the number of ways you can arrange a deck of cards so that they're nice and neat, right? And that number is significantly less than the number of ways you can have cards that are a total mess, right? High entropy, significantly lower entropy. Do we understand the difference here? To get from this to this, does that require effort or is it a spontaneous process? To get from here to here, is that spontaneous or non-spontaneous? That'd be non-spontaneous, right? You'd have to put forth effort to get from here to here. Um, so a process is spontaneous if it increases entropy. Spontaneous processes increase entropy. They increase the disorder. And so when spontaneity decreases, this is order. I think I have a bumper sticker about it up here, right? Reduce entropy. This is in order, right? If you reduce entropy, you are adding order. You're adding order to your system. And then a non-spontaneous process, it's requiring outside intervention, and therefore it's adding order, right? So these two are opposite each other. Does this make sense? It's a lot of vocab today, so I've got the vocab list. All right, so let me just ask you this. Think for yourself. Dumping your clean clothes on the floor and just kind of digging through as you need. Oh, there's a sock. There's the other sock. Or, as soon as your clothes are clean, folding them, putting them away neatly, nice and organized, and then going directly to your sock drawer and just pulling out the pair you need when the time comes. Right? I think everybody knows the answer to those questions. I know I'm guilty of it with my own kids because they'll just pull it all out of the drawer anyway. I'm like, fine, I'll just leave it there for you to dig through, right? This is a lot less effort, isn't it? Yes. Whereas this is a lot more effort. So which one has the higher entropy? The pile of clean clothes, they're clean, but they're just sitting there on the floor versus the folded and neatly put away. Higher entropy, which one? This one's the higher entropy, right? It's got more disorder. You had to decrease order here. I mean, you had to increase order here. So you decreased entropy. So let's 
So another example, you take this beautifully restored car and you park it in the woods and you go away for 20 years, right? This will happen spontaneously. You come back 20 years later and you go, oh man, I forgot about this car, right? Now you gotta go this direction. That's non-spontaneous, right? This going to here is a lot more work than this going here for you, right? For you. Do we see the difference here? One more example. This is a real picture of my living room on basically every Saturday. Um, so I want you to add, I want you to answer the question. This picture contains both high entropy and low entropy. Which parts are the high entropy parts and which parts correspond to the low entropy parts? All right, all this junk over here, that's the high entropy part. Random shoe, pillow. What would be the low entropy part? The track, right? You had to put forth effort to make that track. What else? There are a few things that are actually still on the shelf. It was early in the day when I took this picture. Um, what else? Yeah, there's a Lego tower here, right? That had to require effort, okay? Obviously the random sock and the shoe, not where they're supposed to go. All this pile of junk, not where it's supposed to be. At the end of the day, I make my kids put it all, clean it all back up. Is that adding order or is that adding disorder? That's adding order, right? And it's adding all that grumbling on their part too. But that's okay, you can make a mess, clean it up, right? All right, let's talk about micro states. So the probability of a given arrangement of atoms, for us as chemists, right, depends on the number of microstates. In other words, the number of ways that that particular arrangement can be achieved. So the probability of a given arrangement of atoms, because remember we say that the most probable thing is what's likely going to happen, right? It's kind of duh. Something will happen if it's, Likely that it will happen, duh, right? The most probable arrangement comes from the number of microstates. In other words, the number of ways that you can get there, right? So put it back into basketball terms now that it's a good time of the year to be thinking about that, right? There are lots of places on a basketball court where you can make a two-point shot, right? So the probability of having two-point shots in a game is pretty decent, yes? And so it's gonna be true for atoms, right? The probability of a particular arrangement is a function of the number of ways that you can get to that arrangement, right? The probability of me taking a helicopter to work is pretty low. There's only one way for me to take a helicopter to work. Someone comes in a helicopter and gets me, right? So that's probably not the, the likely thing that will occur. But there are a lot of ways that I could drive my car to work. That's more likely to happen. So the probability of a particular arrangement comes from the number of ways that you could get there. Does this make sense? Something will happen if it's most likely that it will happen. Again, it's kind of like, duh. But you have to stop and think about that as a chemist too, right? The, the reason why molecules are arranged this way is because that's the most, uh, most microstates. That arrangement of atoms has the greatest number of ways to get to that configuration. So if you've ever just, you know, wondered yourself, hmm, why do gases diffuse evenly as opposed to unevenly? If you've really been bored enough to sit around and think about these things, well, let's, let's add some more thought to that. Let's pretend we've got a, we've got a bulb that's got four, uh, you can't probably see it, A, B, C, D. Right? Four particles on this side, and it's completely empty on this side. So how many microstates would give this arrangement? Just one, right? There's only one way that you could have all four on this side, right? And likewise, on the opposite end, there's only one way that you could have all four on this side, right? Okay, how many ways could I have three on one side and one on the other? You could have A by itself, B by itself, C by itself, D by itself, right? So in other words, there are four ways, there are four microstates that you could have three and one. Does that make sense? How many ways could you have two and two? Well, you could have A and B together, A and C together, A and D together, 
B and C, B and D, C and D, right? There's six ways that you can have two and two, and then we're just doing the reverse of this. How many ways could you have one and three? D by itself, C by itself, B by itself, A by itself. Okay, well why do gases, if I have a gas all on this side and I turn the, the thing, and the piston and it opens, why does it diffuse evenly? Because that's the number of microstates that's the biggest, right? How come all of them don't stay on one side? Well, because there's only one way for that to happen. Something only happens if it's most likely that it'll happen. Right? There are the most ways to get to this configuration, which is why your gas diffuses evenly. So if you've ever been laying in my wondering, why is diffusion an even process, right? It's got the greatest number of microstates. And so the more ways we have to get us to a certain configuration, the higher the probability, right? And then we call this the positional entropy. The entropy that something has because of its position, because of its location. Positional entropy is the entropy, order or disorder, that something has because of its position. It's the name positional entropy. So the probability of having a mole of particles all stay on one side is next to zero. Right? That's because remember when you do probability, if I want x to happen and y to happen. You take the probability of x and you multiply by the probability of y. Do you remember statistics? If I want x, y, and z, I take the probability of x, multiply by the probability of y, multiply by the probability of z. Yes? So if I have one molecule, the probability that it's on this side versus the probability that's on this side is one half for one molecule. For two, for three, for five, for ten, for n. Right? So if I have a mole, the probability of it all staying on the left is one half to Avogadro's number, which is 10 to the negative two times 10 to the 23rd. Right, that's essentially zero. Probability of this happening, half on this side, half on this side, is one half. Right, again, something happens if it's most likely that it will happen. Does this make sense? Does this make sense? So let's lead us to the states of matter. Obviously, each state of matter is going to have different positional entropy, right? A gas is way more disordered than a liquid, and a liquid is a lot more disordered than a solid, right? Lowest entropy, medium entropy, way, way, way high entropy, right? Way disordered, pretty disordered, very little disorder, right? Because it's a regular repeating arrangement. Everything's in its nice little spot versus total chaos. And obviously as you increase temperature, right, we're increasing entropy, even in the solid state, we're increasing entropy with temperature because we're adding more disorder every time we do that. So positive delta S means that something is spontaneous and a negative delta S would be non-spontaneous, right? Positive delta S corresponds to spontaneous, negative delta S corresponds to non-spontaneous. Is everyone with me on all this vocab? Feeling good about the vocab. So, we're not even going to look at temperature here because all of these things are going to be spontaneous at one temperature and non spontaneous at another temperature. But let's just pretend that we're at a temperature where solid ice melts into liquid water. So, we're at a temp greater than zero. Would that be spontaneous or non spontaneous? That's spontaneous, why? Well, is liquid more ordered or less ordered? We've increased entropy, right? When we increase entropy, that's a spontaneous process. A liquid becomes a gas. That's spontaneous as well. And again, we, this could be at a temperature where it's non-spontaneous, all things have that possibility, but we're assuming that we're not at you know, some crazy low temperature. Water vapor condenses to liquid water. <coughs> so we've got a gas becoming a liquid. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> what would that be? <coughs> That'd be non-spontaneous, right? Because liquids are less disordered than gases, right? You're taking crazy mess and you're forcing it to become more ordered. That'd be non-spontaneous. And then solid sodium chloride dissolves forms a solution. 
Again, we're assuming at a temperature where this is happening, like room temperature. That'd be spontaneous, right? Because ions are way more disordered than a solid, right? Way, way, way more disordered. All right, second law of thermo says entropy of the universe is increasing, right? Which is what we already said about spontaneity. Spontaneous processes increase entropy. Non-spontaneous processes decrease entropy, right? So to put it into human terms, this is why cleaning is something that you don't do, <laughs> right? I put it off. Um, whereas mess making is spontaneous, which is easier to take your shoes and your socks off and just chuck them wherever or take them straight to where they belong. And I've got... Uh, the problem I have every single morning is I can always only find five shoes. I got six feet to put shoes on and I can always only find five shoes. Okay, we need to get a system here. But that would be non-spontaneous for my kids to actually go put their shoes where they belong, right? They'd much rather just throw it wherever. So things that require effort are non-spontaneous. Things that don't require effort are spontaneous. So let me ask you this. Synthesis of proteins from amino acids, from all you biochem peeps in the audience, that's non-spontaneous, right? To take amino acids and make proteins, proteins are giant macro molecules. They're humongous giant molecules. That's non-spontaneous, right? Because a protein, highly complex, amino acids are pretty complex too, but proteins are way more complex than amino acids. So you are taking something and you are definitely decreasing its entropy. So that's non-spontaneous. But you can't live without proteins, right? If you don't have proteins, you're dead, toast. So, because law of conservation, I mean, because law of thermo says that entropy is always increasing, how are we walking around right now? This is a question of interpretation of our vocab. Because these kind of questions are good tests to see if you really understand your vocabulary. Anyone got an idea? Because this kind of question on a test would really probe, do you understand the vocab? What's your thought? Oh no, we're very, very low entropy because we're so dis because we're so ordered. We've got very, very low entropy. So there is a relationship between system and surroundings, yes, absolutely. Yes, that's one of the ways we're gonna take this. And another thing to think about, non-spontaneous doesn't mean it can't happen or it won't happen. Non-spontaneous just means that it won't happen without outside assistance, right? For your cells to carry out the process of making a protein, right? That requires energy. Where do you get that energy? You eat, right? So just because something is non-spontaneous, doesn't mean it won't happen or it can't happen. It just means that it won't or can't happen without outside assistance. Okay, so that's what we need to look at here. So yes, without, without proteins, we're, we're goners. <laughs> we're not here to talk about spontaneity at all because we're not here, right? Non-spontaneous doesn't mean can't happen, just means can't happen without outside assistance. So we eat, that's a source of energy for us that allows these things to take place. And so what does thermo tell us and what can it not tell us? We're going to use it to predict whether or not something will happen. Yes, it will. No, it won't. But it won't give us any information about how long it's going to take. It won't give us any information about the, the process, right, the kinetics. It's just going to say, will it happen? Will it not happen? Okay? Will it happen with help or will it need help? At what temperature will it occur? At what temperature will it not occur? So yes or no, right? It's not gonna give us any information about how long it's gonna take. It's not gonna give us any, you know, kinetics all answers this question about time, right? Um, it also can't tell us how is it gonna happen. We're not gonna hear it, we're not gonna look at that in thermodynamics, that's a kinetics question. Um, so this was actually something we did back in the kinetics um, section. I, I kind of laid this groundwork. A diamond should spontaneously become graphite. 
Because if you do the calculations, thermodynamics says, yes, this is a spontaneous process. But it's not going to tell you how long it's going to happen. So I have lovely diamond here. I don't think I'm in danger of it turning into graphite on a timeline that I care about, right? Thermodynamics isn't going to tell you how long it's going to take for that to happen. And then this was something that I heard mentioned a minute ago about the system versus surroundings bit, right? Spontaneous processes increase the entropy of the universe, but they may not necessarily increase the particular entropy of your system. And that's important too, right? We still have to look at, does this process increase the entropy of my system? Or does it increase the entropy of my entire universe? Or is it somewhere in between, right? We can have a mixture here. And so we need to look at both the surroundings and the system when we're dealing with some thermodynamics. So I think you're seeing probably by the looks of some of your faces, this can get complicated quick, right? There are a lot of moving parts that we have to consider all the time, which is why you take entire courses on thermodynamics and we're gonna study it for three weeks, right? There's a lot of moving parts here. So the entropy of the surroundings, entropy of the surroundings, is negative, and what's delta H again? Heat, right, enthalpy, over T. We calculate the change in entropy of the surroundings by negative delta H over T. Wanted to throw that one out there in case you see that on the homework. I can't remember if there's a calculation of that or not. So let's do this one together. Here's the reaction, and here's its delta H. And I want to know what's the entropy change of the surroundings at 25 degrees Celsius. Is the pressure here relevant? <coughs> no, it doesn't factor in. A temperature needs to be the Kelvin temperature. All right, so delta S would be just negative delta H. Negative over negative is positive. And then don't forget to convert Celsius to Kelvin. So my units would be kilojoules per Kelvin here. Okay, so if you see something like that on your uh, homework, calculating delta S of the surroundings is a relatively easy calculation. Okay. So here's another reaction. And I want to know what's delta S of the surroundings at 50 degrees Celsius and at one atmosphere pressure. Doing some antimony chemistry. All right, let's look at what we got. Do we agree? 2.41 kilojoules per Kelvin. Okay, if we're trying to decide if a reaction is spontaneous or non-spontaneous based only on positional entropy, right, this one, oops, that's not the mouse, that's my clicker. This one is lower in entropy, this one is higher in entropy, right? So if we're just determining is a reaction spontaneous or non-spontaneous, this was something we were looking at a few minutes ago, without factoring in temperature, Right? Because today we're not doing any calculations to involve temperature. Without calculating in temperature, we can just look at positional entropy to decide will something happen spontaneously or not spontaneously, right? But obviously, at a given temperature, the temperature is going to play in at some point. So just looking at positional entropy, is that going to be enough to decide is something really spontaneous or not? No, we're going to have to actually factor in the temperature as well. So without considering temperature, which is kind of a weak way to do this, without factoring in temperature, would we predict positive delta S or negative delta S for the first one? Let's just do it together. What do we think? Positive delta S or negative delta S? We're taking two separate things and combining them into one. What is that in terms of entropy? This would be negative, right? Delta S is negative here. Because number of gas molecules is going down, right? We have decreased entropy. 
SO3 is more complicated than SO2 is by itself. Right? We've made something that's more complicated than what we began with. That decreased entropy. Now again, we're not looking at temperature. Right? One of the things I'm trying to get you to think about here is that without looking at temperature, it's kind of weak. Right? Because once temperature comes into the picture, it's a lot easier to diagnose spontaneous or non-spontaneous. What about the second one? A solid becoming a solid and a gas. That one's positive. Why? Right. Anytime you're making a gas, that's way more entropy than a solid is. Right? So there's way more positional entropy in this gas than there would be in the solid. Good. Let's just keep doing these together. You've got this copper 2 sulfate pentahydrate. You are making it anhydrous. We did this last semester in Chem 1 to determine the empirical formula. Do you remember doing this, what the colors were? Started out blue, it became what color? Like a grayish white, remember when we dehydrated it? Now what do we have to do to get that to happen? Do you remember? We had to heat the snot out of it, right? What's happening here? Is this spontaneous or non-spontaneous at room temperature? Be non-spontaneous, right? But at a high temperature, it's very spontaneous, right? Temperature is playing a role here, but we're just assuming that we're at a temperature where this reaction occurs. So, hmm, assuming we're at a temperature where this reaction occurs, is that going to be a positive delta S or a negative delta S? Positive, why? You increase positional entropy, right? You made a gas. Good. What about here? Again, we're assuming we're at a temperature where this occurs. Negative, why? All right, you had two gases, and now you've only got one, right? This is more complex than these two are by themselves. Good. And then the third law of thermodynamics, it says that the entropy of a perfect crystal at zero Kelvin, i.e. absolute zero, is zero, right? The only way to have zero entropy ever is to be a perfect crystal at absolute zero, right? Remember, temperature is a measure of kinetic energy. If you're at absolute zero, there's no motion. And every time you start increasing motion, you're going to increase disorder. Because if it can move, then it's going to be disordered in some way, right? Movement goes along with disorder. So disorder increases with temperature, right? There's a relationship between temperature and disorder. If you want your kid to be punished, you say, go stand over there on those steps and don't move, right? You're taking away the privilege of moving. Disorder, right? Disorder increases with temperature. Temperature is oh, what's allowing you to move, right? So as that perfect crystal's temperature is increased, disorder starts creeping in, right? So this is the only way you're going to have zero entropy is if you have zero temperature. Because once you start adding in the temperature, you're going to start moving in and you're going to have it. Make sense? Make sense? All right, so I know I went through a lot of vocab today. Easy on the math, heavy on the vocab. So that's where we're going to stop. I will see you Wednesday.